Okay, what's up everybody? David Parsons here. This is Nostalgia Trap. I have had way too much coffee this morning, so buckle up. We got Rick Perlstein on the show today. Very excited to bring you that conversation. Rick Perlstein is someone whose books uh, I've spent a lot of time with over the years. I'm sure you know his name and his work, uh, but he's written four incredible books about the rise of modern conservatism in America, uh, including books like Nixon Land and his latest, Reagan Land, America's Right Turn, 1976 to 1980. So I, I have a conversation with him about nostalgia, about culture, about the way that, you know, sort of uh, the culture war became a language through which uh, conservatism found power. Uh, and it's hard not to comment on the moment we're in right now when uh, the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg seems like a kind of reckoning on the direction of things uh, that and certainly the direction of things that Perlstein has been writing about in his books uh, for the last several decades. Uh, we've seen, you know, liberalism sort of replace ideas and discourse about power with uh, with sentiment. And I'm seeing, you know, Chuck Schumer uh, on uh, 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 in Congress this morning. Uh, you know, essentially begging Republicans uh, to, to honor the wishes of Ruth Bader Ginsburg on her deathbed. And if they don't, we'll never trust you again. And I'm thinking to myself, well, Chuck, I mean, obviously the Republicans are going to replace uh, RBG before Trump leaves. And they're going to do that uh, because they have the power to do, do so. And it's within the Constitution. And that's that. Uh, in other words, replacing ideas of power and how power works with this sort of sentimental, romantic, West Wing ass discourse about governing uh, really is uh, is ignorant and took us into a, the direction where liberals have uh, no power to stop what's coming here. Uh, so that narrative is something that uh, I talk a little bit uh, uh, to Rick Perlstein about in terms of the broad strokes of how we got here. Uh, and I hope you enjoy that conversation. You know, we're talking a lot more about culture and movies. Speaking of culture wars, uh, we're talking a lot more about culture and movies on Nostalgia Trap lately. Uh, we've really enjoyed your your feedback, and it seems like people are really enjoying our episodes uh, with, Dan with Danny Bessner uh, on Falling Down, which was last week. We have a lot more of that stuff coming, and much of it is going to be on our Patreon. So subscribe to our Patreon if you want to support our work. Movies are, you know, they're something that are a big part of of who I am, uh, not only as a as a as a as a human being, but uh, as a scholar too. I mean, I studied movies. That was my my degree at UCSB and um, at, at the City University of New York. I did the doctoral certificate program in in film studies. So film as a sort of um, important element in understanding the bigger picture is certainly uh, something that I want to talk about a lot more on the show. Uh, but at the same time, I don't want to make these these episodes. Uh, I don't want to charge any more for them, even though I'm going to be putting a lot more work into the show. So um, all those episodes will be for subscribers at any level. Uh, but with that being said, uh, I do want to request that those who are able to sign up for our $10 Culture Warrior Movie Club. Um, and the perk of that and the bonus of that for the people that are able and willing to do that um, is we're going to hold monthly live Zoom episodes of Nostalgia Trap where we'll take on particular movies. And the first one will be with Danny Bessner. It will be about uh, the incest porno uh, Back to the Future, known as Back to the Future with Michael J. Fox. Uh, we'll be talking about that film uh, sometime in October. We haven't scheduled it yet. Uh, we want to see how many people are interested in in kind of getting into a deeper discussion of film with us. So if you can, uh, again, only if you can, but if you are, can and are willing to uh, sign up for that ten dollar a month tier, uh, because we really want to want to start something talking about um, film in, at a much deeper level and want to bring people in on that. But at the same time, you know, we're putting a lot of work into these episodes, um, so it's time. Um, I think to, to put them behind a paywall a little bit. So that being said, uh, support the show if you can. Uh, Patreon.com slash Nostalgia Trap. We appreciate it. And speaking of that, um, you know, we're starting this film series with, with Danny Bessner specifically on films about and taking place in uh, Los Angeles in the 90s. Uh, so we've already put up our, uh, our episode on Falling Down, which we got a great response to. Uh, and we've got a lot more coming, including an episode on L.A. Confidential next week. So those will be posted weekly for subscribers. And I wanted to talk to Danny a little bit more about uh, what we're doing with that. Uh, so 
let's talk to Danny. All right, Danny. Well, we talked about Zodiac yesterday with Bill Black. That's going to be going up on the Patreon this week. How did we do? One out of 10 stars. Uh, 10 at least, maybe even higher. It was amazing. <laughs> Everybody listening to this should subscribe to the Patreon of uh, the Nostalgia Trap. And David, I always notice you say Patreon, yeah. which is kind of like a weird little accent. Isn't it Patreon? Uh, dude, I, I pronounce everything incorrectly. I, I don't know what that is. It's like the non-accent of coming from Southern California. So I don't know. <laughs> Patri- I, I think I've sometimes said Patreon, sometimes Patreon. Like, I, I really no, I've noticed it. It's is, Patri- uh, you say it, Patreon. <laughs> is, there like, is there a proper pronunciation of that? Uh, probably not. My guess is, you know, Patreon, but, you know, what do I, I like know? To, yeah, <laughs> I like to throw a little Latin flair on it. And Patreon, like, sounds, I don't know. <laughs> It That's sounds so like beautiful. Te- sounds like tequila, yeah, like um, a flamenco dancer. Shit, man! I just I just mentioned on the the introduction here the, uh, uh, about uh, the RBG uh, death as a sort of like reckoning on American liberalism. I don't know if you would agree with this. This was my sort of thesis that, that basically like I don't know if you saw Chuck Schumer like basically begging Republicans not to do what exactly they're <laughs> gonna do, but like he was like basically just relying on sentiment, like literally like hey don't do this because we'll never trust you again and how could we ever trust you and like she made a, a deathbed a deathbed letter that said you know you shouldn't do this and and my I was basically saying that like liberalism over the last many decades has sort of replaced ideas about power with like this kind of sentimental discourse. Um, do you think I'm wrong about that? Am I full of shit or, or am I on, well, the r- on the right path there? Because it seems like the RBG thing so certainly fits into that. I mean, it's been, it's been, you know, forefront of my mind recently, and it's been like um, something that I've been thinking about for a long time. And I mean, I think there's probably, you know, a, a complex set of answers to, um, what exactly happened to liberalism uh, over the past few decades. And and what I've come up with is that um, I think that liberalism really did become hegemonic in the 1940s and 1950s and thereafter. And what I mean by liberalism is not just the current instantiation of, of American liberalism, but in sort of like if you think of the 19th century as industrialization giving rise to these grand ideologies, you know, there's liberalism, there's fascism, there's communism, um, there's conservatism in sort of an Edmund Burkean sense. Um, and all of these ideologies in my mind are basically trying to address the question of what do you do in liberal modernity? Mm. Uh, not liberal modernity, sorry. What do you do in modernity? And I think um, of those ideological battles, like liberals won. Um, And what, you know, what we call the Democratic and Republican parties in this country, what we call liberal and conservative, are actually two different wings of 19th century liberalism that emphasize different things. Um, Mm. And I think what happened in the 40s is that this sort of center left version of liberalism triumphed and the institutions that currently comprise the American state. um, uh, And of course, the American state in its modern instantiation is really only built in the 30s and the 40s as a result of the New Deal in World War II, a lot of those institutions are really like liberal in origin. And so I think liberalism itself and and liberals got a a little bit complacent. Um, And I think what we're seeing now is the exhaustion of an idea of this particular form of this ideology that it can't even defend itself when it's... um, it's coming under supreme attack. And I, I, I just got to say, this is a criticism of liberalism that goes back a long time to the 19th century. And perhaps the most uh, important exponent of this critique of liberalism is the Nazi jurist Carl Schmitt, who essentially argued that if you're a liberal society, you'll never be able to you know, thrive in the world in his organicist conception because you don't have the ability to like recognize power, uh, where power is located. Mm. And, and, and it's unfortunate. I think we're seeing that um, right now. Did you see that tweet I posted? today that kind of went like a not really viral but got a, a little viral a little bit of pl- what no what it say uh, i basically someone was responding it was actually the, the television critic matt zoller cites mm-hmm. um i'm actually going to read it because I, it, it relates directly to this so yeah. he quoted matt walsh um who is i guess a conservative thinker and matt walsh said i'll just read it because it's short quote to be clear i wanted mcconnell co- to refuse to hold hearings for garland because i didn't want garland on the court i want the hearings now because i do want trump's pick on the court that's the way the game is played, you dumb whiners. It's not hypocrisy. It's just politics, end quote. And this is what Zoller Seitz responded. Um, 
quote, I appreciate Matt Walsh's honesty here. To Republicans, politics is about ideology and the exercise of power. Concepts like consistency and honor are traps for the gullible. This is Republicanism distilled to a handful of sentences, end quote. And then I, quote, tweeted all these and I said, quote, Jesus Christ, now all caps. This is what politics always is. Then I went back to normal. Sometimes I feel like I'm losing my mind. Only the well-heeled and comfortable can think politics is about anything other than, back to all caps, distributing resources and exercising power. End tweet. <laughs> and I mean, and this is what politics is. And I think it's a fundamental problem that, that liberals haven't identified this in a serious way. Yeah. Um, you have a much more eloquent way of putting what I was trying to say earlier. And I think it's it's part of what emerges out of our Zodiac conversation um, on the Patreon this week is that is this sort of idea of this like um, fractured reality that emerges in, in out of the 1960s and 1970s. Some people, you know, I, we, the way I put it on the sh- on the Zodiac show is it's sort of like that Zodiac is about epistemology and about sort of the the, the limits of knowledge and, and liberals not sort of really grappling with a, a world that no longer had coherent uh, narratives and, 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 and sort of uh, uh, not really uh, capitalizing on on really postmodernism in the same way that conservatives did. And I wonder what you thought of that idea because I don't think we, we mentioned the word postmodernism in the episode, but it was something that I was thinking about after you and me and, and, and Bill talked about Zodiac was this idea that you know, postmodernism fractures the the cultural reality, um, and 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 the internet ex- accelerates that fracture. And conservatives have capitalized that, uh, capitalized on that in a way that liberals have not. And what I mean by that is, is, is conservatives sort of can can capitalize on a truthiness, a sort of a sort of emotional reality, and a, and a sort of emotional truth rather than um, the sort of ordered. Uh, evidence-based, data-based reality that liberals depend upon. Um, do you think I'm on the right track there? That's some, that's sort of a mega thesis that I'm I've been working through uh, since we talked about Zodiac. I, I think that's right, and I mean I think it actually becomes pretty clear. There's that famous Karl Rove quote, something along the lines of "We are the empire; we create our own history." And of course, it was Donald Rumsfeld who have the famous "known unknowns, unknown knowns, unknown unknowns," right? Which are really questions of epistemology. And I think that this is all a response to sort of the waning of liberal hegemony in the 1960s and 70s that we actually talked about in Zodiac, right? Like I think that liberalism, in a, in a real way, has been on its heels for 50 years, and it was never able to achieve the type of hegemony hegemony it did in the 50s and 60s. Um, and I think there was an, uh, the, the thing that did achieve hegemony was essentially an economic philosophy, which is embedded with moral and political ideas, but was really the idea of laissez-faire neoliberal capitalism. And it's that sort of ideology, which is liberal in origins, of course, going back to the 19th century, hence neoliberalism, um, which is what really spread through society. But I think sort of the vanguard of neoliberalism is how I would put it, was much more aware of um, what it takes to actually win and wield power, because when they were coming of age, they, they weren't hegemonic. In, in the 1950s and 1960s. But again, I think this is almost an artifact of an older generation. I'm, I'm not sure there's really like a young conservative base right now. Mm. So I really do think, I don't think we're like in a moment of conservative ascendance. I think both, you know, the both sides of 19th century, century liberalism, sort of the left side, which we call in the US liberal, and the right side of liberalism, which we call in the US conservatism, are both kind of exhausted ideologies. I mean, it's not like the alt-right is pointing a path forward in any meaningful yeah, way or I Donald mean, you- Trump. You say that, but I mean, uh, I mean the the reality. Uh, you talk about power and like you know material power. Um, you know the Supreme Court still is 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 the, the 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 wielder of that power more than any other institution in American life, and they're about to be taken over by you know a conservative majority that will you know probably overturn Roe versus Wade within the next couple years. Um, and that and that, that means that conservatives do have power and do and and have won something, right? I mean, I, I, it seems that way. Maybe it won't. Oh, la- oh, maybe it sure. won't last. I mean, you I mean, you might be right generationally that like they might not have a base in the coming, you know, generations. But I don't know. Yeah, no. I, I mean, this is the big question to me, right? I mean, conservatives are old. I mean, they're they're that's just a <laughs> fact. Right. Like, I mean, people basically under 40, maybe even under 45. I mean, they're broadly speaking on the on the center left or the left. So, I mean, it is absolutely true. And I think this is true, not just in the Supreme Court, but in Congress as well. Uh, Like we're clearly a gerontocracy right now. Mm. But the thing is about gerontocracies, um, they die uh, or the people who (laughs) comprise them die. And then what comes next? I don't know, because like literally generations of people haven't been given the chance to exercise leadership in a meaningful way. Um, But it just doesn't seem to me and I might be 
be wrong. I'm not saying that conservatives don't have power. Very clearly they do. Um, I, I co- totally agree. It just doesn't seem like this is a vibrant political philosophy that is going to define the world in 100 years. I mean, we may just be all underwater from climate catastrophe anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But it, it does seem like we're in that Gramscian moment where the old world is dead, the ideologies of the old world is dead, but the new struggles to be born, and we don't know what is going to come next. And that's why it feels so like liminal, and that's why it feels like a very shaky and unstable political moment. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. And and, and I think that's part of the, the chaos I'm kind of referring to in the fact that um, it feels like, for at least for the moment, conservatives are, are capitalizing on that, on that cultural and political and social chaos um, in a way that liberals aren't. Um, but uh, we're, you and I are doing a, a, a L.A. film series. Uh, we'll, we'll be talking about, uh, a ver- I'm very much looking forward to watching L.A. Confidential approximately 10 to 15 times before we talk about it uh, next week, Danny. Um, but, but you want to say a word about that? Because I, I'm, I'm very excited uh, that we're, we're doing this. I think we're going to try to put out a lot of, of, uh, of episodes about uh, uh, Los Angeles films, specifically in the '90s. Do you want to do you want to say a, a bit about why we're doing that? Sure. I mean, well, I, I could speak for myself, and then David, you could tell me if you agree or disagree. But I mean, um, I, I I definitely um, am kind of tired of sort of horse race political thinking, and I don't think we, as sort of a podcast, and you know, as friends who do this together, don't really have much new to add to that conversation. And I think that's really going to control uh, the discourse in the coming months, and 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 uh, probably thereafter, yeah. not horse race politics, but sort of politics. And, and I also think it's just like. A, I, I'm just personally interested in the moment and, and taking a step back and sort of um, analyzing the the decade uh, that I think is really critical to understanding our own current moment, the 1990s, the sort of interregnum period where a lot of the trends that we're currently dealing with, I think, really took off. And I think examining these trends through popular culture is obviously something meaningful and that's something that has been done for a long time. Um, and I think personally, at least, I, I want to do L.A. because, as I've said on this podcast, I think it's the ultimate imperial city in a diversity of ways. And I think it's... Um, um, really important to examine what sort of this ultimate imperial city and, and people portraying it were, were doing in the 1990s. Um, not only, you know, um, examining sort of contemporary L.A. like we did in Falling Down or like we will probably do with the Tarantino movie, but also how um, various artists and directors in the 90s portrayed historical Los Angeles mm. and sort of the, yeah. the construction of the city. And uh, I think it's going to be a really interesting series. Um, and I think if people have any I- ideas of movies that they want to um, ask us to do they could either dm us or email us we're trying to gauge interest and see who's um, interested and if there does seem to be interest i I hope that this will be just the first in a a number of series that tackle uh different different subjects um and that we'll do over the next few months and, and years yeah, same here. I'm really excited about it. And and for, for speaking for me, I mean, uh, part of this emerged out of uh, teaching at Emerson College in Los Angeles over the last few years. I, I taught a few courses on uh, on Los Angeles and the image of Los Angeles in uh, in film, uh, and, and 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 sort of tied that to the history of Los Angeles because I'm a historian too, and ended up with like a a, a sort of picture of. Of, of of Los Angeles as a as a producer of of the, a sort of image of L A and an image of California, but also an image of um, the United States at the same time existing in uh, as a real city and and the politics of that city being very very different from from what is is portrayed in, on, on the screen in the in the American in the American imagination and that sort of dialectic is 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 really a, a critical element in in how a lot of theorists like Mike Davis and others have thought about LA that's what I want to get at too in, in kind of 90s movies and I have a million probably too many uh, to think about in terms of like you know speed and who framed roger rabbit um and uh repo man and a million others so yeah if people have ideas throw them at us uh, on the patreon if you're subscribers or on twitter wherever you find us uh but thanks danny we're gonna get to our interview with rick perlstein in a minute but i'm looking forward to la confidential next week and yeah tons of uh tons of episodes in the future so thanks for joining us yeah of course and uh looking forward to hearing from everyone Okay, thanks, Danny Bessner, for that chat. And go check out our film series. We are very excited and very proud of what we're putting together there. So patreon.com slash nostalgia trap is where you do that. And thank you so much for the people that are supporting the show and and also the people that are that are sending us comments and making us feel good about what we're doing and telling us we're doing the right thing. That's always wonderful to hear. So thanks for that. Uh, and as promised, let's get to Rick Perlstein. You know, Rick Perlstein, as I mentioned, is someone who whose work is 
uh, a favorite of mine. I think I have I get more pleasure and enjoyment from reading his books than than most other books I've read in the last several years. And that's in part because of uh, the the sort of nostalgia trap of going back in time and being in the 1960s and and the sort of world that. Uh, that Rick recreates in his books is so meticulously constructed with uh, bits of popular culture uh, and a real sort of uh, novelistic narrative that draws you in. Uh, I can't really say enough about about what uh, a, a, a wonderful historical writer Rick Perlstein is. So uh, this was a great conversation. As I mentioned at the end, I, I could talk to Rick Perlstein forever. There are so many questions I could have asked him, but he only had a little bit of time. So I hope you enjoy uh, the chat we had. Um, here is my conversation with the one and only Rick Perlstein. All right. Well, Rick Perlstein, it is uh, uh, an incredible honor to speak with you. You're someone I've spent a lot of time with over the last many years uh, <laughs> reading your incredible series of books. I just want to start off by saying congratulations on uh, completing Ragged Land and publishing it in the middle of a pandemic. Um, it seems like it seems like a good pausing point for you. You've produced four of these things, um, but they've just yes. uh, yeah. But congratulations and thank you for writing them because they're um, they're always an adventure. And I would say you know maybe just to start us off, you know they're they're they remind me of when I was. Um, so so what's great about Reagan Land to me is you finally I've been reading these books for years. You finally got to the year that I was born. So I was born in 1978, and and Reagan right. and Reagan Land covers 1976 yeah. to 1980. So, you know, one of the things that I remember as a kid is getting those on your birthday, getting those little books that said, you know, what are the things that happened during the year that you were born? Um, right. So this, right. your books are, and this book in particular is like a journey into all of that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Proposition 13. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, what's crazy about um, 1978 is a dark a fucking year, kids. man. Like 78 is just yeah, filled with gonna, like. Did they mention John Wayne Gacy in the little birthday book? I don't think so. You know that that's what it's funny you mention that because it's like you're right. I mean it's John Wayne Gacy, it's uh the Jonestown massacre. I mean it just yeah. goes on and on and you you catalog those terrors quite well. Um but I want to just to start us off because I know people know your history and you you've kind of you you've you've said this on many podcast and interviews I've heard heard you talk about sort of uh, discovering the Renaissance bookstore in Milwaukee, and there's yes. a there's a really great like Rick Perlstein origin story. But so I don't yeah. want to go have you rehearse all those details. But I I wanted to kind of ask you my question, which is, what do you think is about about the kind of nostalgia for the age? You know, right yeah. when you were born or right before you were born, totally. because I have that yeah. for myself. Like I'm reading this book, Reagan Land, and yeah. I'm like, this is amazing. I get to find out what the world was like when I was born. Um, right. What, how, how operative was that for you in your life? Yeah, I the, the, the editor for Before the Storm and for our Strauss and Giroux, my first book, he did say that people are most most his his experience are people is mo are most interested in or maybe they write most interestingly about. The, really the period that formed their parents, I guess. Mm. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, since you're a good, you know, history PhD, you know, the feminist theorist, Julia Kristeva, uh, she said all theory is a form of autobiography and mm. we're all just kind of working out our shit, right? Yeah. So, I mean, for me, you know, um, luckily being born in 1969, you know, being interested in the world that, you know, kind of I was born into, you know, it's it's a no brainer. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, and yet at the same time, being interested in the world that kind of created my parents, um, I think this is kind of part of the origin story, I guess. I maybe you've heard me tell this story is a, it kind of presents a contradiction and maybe out of that contradiction and that tension, you know, my originality, you know, kind of was was forged. And the tension is you know, asking my parents to tell me 60s stories, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And you know, from kind of popular culture, from some kind of loose, you know, kind of reading that kind of a precocious, you know, maybe 15-year-old kid would be doing, you know, about the 1960s, you know, you want to hear, you know, uh, I march with Martin Luther King, or I remember... <laughs> You know, I don't know. Maybe I remember where I was when Kennedy was shot or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. You know, 
or whatever, you know, you, you name it. Oh, this one time we, you know, like dropped acid, you know, with, mm-hmm. uh, with, with you know, the, the Sagers down the street or something like that. But when I asked this uh, question of my mom, and I think I must have been like around that age, she said, oh, well, like there was the time when there were riots downtown in Milwaukee and none of us and our friends could go to go to our businesses to work. So we had a pool party. (laughs) And of course, I grew up in a suburb and we had a pool, you know, until we moved to another house when I was seven and it didn't have a pool, but it wasn't behind a white picket fence. It was kind of a behind a weathered kind of wood picket fence, you know. And of course, later when I researched Nixon, I learned, you know, what happened in Milwaukee in 1967 and learned that it was absolutely horrifying. It really wasn't the kind of uprising slash riot that was horrifying. That was pretty small and contained with one within one day. But uh, it was, you know, the cops, you know, burning down a mentally retarded man's house because they thought he'd shot a BB gun at them. That was, you know, horrifying. And it was the mayor of Milwaukee, Henry Meyer, who was horrifying because he was basically a fascist who Mm -hmm. talked about Milwaukee's good Bavarian sense of order who declared a 24 hour lockdown of the city. So like children, mothers couldn't even get like food for their infants. And, you know, and I um, somehow remember tracking down the guy who ran against Henry Meyer for mayor in 1968. And it was like this great, like Adlai Stevenson liberalism movement in which he said, uh, um, I had 20 position papers you know, and <laughs> Henry Meyer was reelected with 80 percent of the vote. Yeah. Right. So I guess realizing that um, the 60s was something the 60s as kind of popular memory, the nostalgia. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the nostalgia trap of the 60s yeah. is that um, the normal account of, you know, this drama. I think a lot of people, a lot of a lot of nostalgia um you know is about placidity you know this Mm. kind of wonderfully you know kind of self-contained safe world but i think a lot of nostalgia for the 60s is precisely the melodrama you know the danger the excitement certainly Mm -hmm. for baby boomers yeah but for other people you know the kind of the richer you know uh history that transcends the nostalgia is that that 60s was something a lot of people wanted to be protected against. Mm, mm-hmm. And, you know, the retreat behind the white picket fence is really kind of what, you know, Nixon land, you know, is about. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. It, it's interesting. Cause it feels like there's a, there's a group of Americans that are nostalgic for, you know, the revolutionary turmoil of the 1960s and Woodstock yeah. and all that kind of stuff. But there's also, the, the 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 nostalgia for the 1950s it seems like or the world before right. that uh, it seems like Reagan right. I mean it seems like even that it's make America nostalgia yeah really. make America great again seems like it's about that and I'm thinking about you as a 15 year old I'm doing the math now that's like 1984 right so yeah, you know totally. you're, you're starting to think about this in the middle of the the Reagan years and God I mean I was Bore, a little boring Reagan years yeah. yeah I was a little bit younger but I mean I'm thinking about like a, a movie like Back to the Future that was just right. you know a very much about it, I mean it taught me as a kid because my parents loved that movie and I think part of their love for it was sort of malt shop memories um and and yeah. kind of trying to because right. i think my, so you know one of the insights i had doing invisible bridge which you know carries over you know enormously into reagan land was just how much popular culture in the 1970s was you know profoundly nostalgic even you know even um in kind of surprising ways like you know the fact that the exorcist ends with a scene of Reagan and her mom, who is kind of a stand in for like the radical actor, you know, Sir Shirley MacLaine, you know, kind of single mother, you know, symbol of, you know, all that had gone kind of crazy in the 60s and 70s. They're literally wearing um, um, identical outfits that look like something Jackie Kennedy would wear, mm-hmm. you know, or the fact that you know, um, American graffiti, when they have the little shtick at the end where they kind of say where the characters are now, you know. It, it takes place in like 1962, mm. you know, and then, you know, one of the characters like, you know, dies in Vietnam, but even Animal House, which also takes place in like 1962, you know, and this is kind of nostalgia for, you know, college hijinks that doesn't involve politics. 
And um, they also have that conceit where they like they're like, where are the characters now? Mm. And Pluto Patel becomes a senator. Yeah. <laughs> that um, makes me think of yeah, uh, Gr- yeah. Greece uh, in 1978, which is always mentioned in, 19, in those books totally. of my birthday. It was always Greece was the was the word in uh, in, in the year I was born. Yeah, Greece was the word, right? Yeah, and I mean and, that led to happy days and everything else, right? Well, so like yeah, so when I was in kindergarten, we had like Fonzie Day. Happy Days was the <laughs> political, you know. And then second grade, it was Star Wars. So you know, nostalgia was you know a huge. But I think I like this idea. You know, I've never really thought about it. This the civil war of contending nostalgias, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like a lot of. I, I talk about um, so by the time I'm growing up, the '60s has been kind of turned into this marketable trope. And I call it the the minivan version of the 1960s. And like the, the, they're, they're selling a minivan, you know, and the commercial's like, you know, you marched and blah, blah, blah. You burned your bra. And then you settled down and this is the car for you because it's a little bit rebellious, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, and that's, right? that, that's like, that yeah. seems like the ad in like 1987. Somewhere in there, yes, I feel like exactly. mi- minivans got popular exactly. around there. Yeah. You know, when I did my article for Lingua Franca on, on, on 60s interpretations, it turns out 1987 was like a year, like where like 10 of the big 60s books came out. Like, you know, like Todd Gitlin's book about the 60s and stuff like that. So it's like 20 years later. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's really interesting. Uh, that 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 um, article you're referring to, the uh, uh, sort of, you know, who who, owns, who the owns the 60s. I was just looking at that and, and it made me think a lot about sort of the generation that I'm a part of and wondering, you know, where that where that is, because I'm a part of a group of. Well, first of all, your who owns the 60s? Your article is great to me. It was like um, and that was in 96, that that article that you. Yeah. Yeah. 96, yeah. And you were identified. And so, I mean, those those people were in their late thirties, the people that you were kind of talking about and, and forties, the people that the, were the baby boomers. You yeah. Mean? Right. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, Somewhere I guess there? they would be kind of in their thirties and forties. Right. So baby boomers, kind of like a typical baby boomer is kind of born in like 1950. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so and thirties and forties. And so, right. Yeah. And so you were sort of, um, uh, talking about the dominance of, of baby boomers writing the sixties history and, and, and sort of right. what, what that might mean for historians coming after them, uh, that are sort of writing against right. the narrative that they created, that they were involved in and sort of maybe centered themselves yes. in. Um, yes. and you know, we won't name names, but you name names in that article. Um, but either way, yeah. I'm thinking about I like, name one of them. yeah, your, your generation of, 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 of scholars in, in the sixties and, and sort of how, how that changed that interpretation. Cause it seems like the, one of the main interventions you're doing is sort of decentering that college sort of, yeah. you know, Berkeley in the sixties thing. Right. Well, but, I mean, yeah, it's like you know, youth politics, like, you know, the people who threw rocks at Martin Luther King were in their, you know, twenties too, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know? And, you know, George Wallace had a huge youth following. And, of course, Barry Goldwater. And I'm thinking now, like, I'm literally in arguments online with literally some of the people I was, like, writing about who are friends and colleagues now. And they're all, like, absolutely convinced that uh, Joe Biden's going to lose because of the slogan, defund the police and riots. And I keep on saying, no, look at the actual evidence look at the polls look at the you know the fact that even the people who think the riots are terrible don't think they have anything to do with joe biden (laughs) but they're they're so possessive of this memory that this is what happens when there's a backlash they're so formed by that trauma of their radical idealism being dashed by you know nixon and reagan um that their supposed, you know, hard won wisdom of history, you know, is really a way of not even looking at the present. Yeah. Yeah. Right? I, we, we, I mean, you saw that with the, um, the, the Bernie Sanders, you know, I mean, we could talk about him forever, but I mean, the, 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 pr- the primary this year seems like a lot of people were in the category you're talking about kind of saying, well, this is McGovern all over again, you know, and sort of, right. you know, McGovern they're all over. right. Their reference points are always sort of this, um, real disappointment that they felt at in the late 60s and early 70s uh, when they felt like they lost and they sort of that's become the sort of way they interpret all the rest of the rest of American politics it seems like yeah it's like when my dad said you know growing up uh, that you know I, I, I would I would get rid of these left-wing notions as soon as I had to make a payroll like a real grown-up you know it's like and then you know 
um, because, you know, that's the way I guess it was with him, right? <laughs> but yeah. with, you know, uh, a guy, you know, who used to be an SDS, you know, it's like, well, you have these notions that you can, you know, create social change now, but just you wait until, you know, the sub, the suburban moms get a hold of that. And it's like, no, the suburban moms are the ones that were actually, you know, for Medicare for all now, you know? Right, um, right. And, and, and so, also that that notion of like, you know, it's the it's I, that stupid Churchill quote about as you get older, you know, you're, you'll be conservative. Um, it seems a lot of that seems I've to- kind of just the opposite for like a long time. Yeah. It's like my yeah. dad was, like, you know, like a, a addicted to Rachel Maddow once he didn't have to make a payroll. You know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, it's, it seems yeah, like it's you, dependent you on the idea that what? you're going to. um it, well, once you get a mortgage and once you get, you know, all these, you know, all the kind of material goods to protect and once you're paying taxes, you're, you're no longer going to be a, a you know, a left wing radical. But it seems like fewer and fewer people are going to get those things like mortgages. Well, and- that's true, too. But also maybe once you have a mortgage, you want a little social democracy. So, uh. you know, the polls don't you know, steal it from you. I don't know. There's lots of there's lots of there's lots of ways to reason your way into uh, a more capacious sense of the national community, you know, um, beyond being young and naive. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. No, that makes sense. So, I mean, I'm thinking about sort of my uh, I, I hate I hate the word my generation, but I mean, just the just the cohort I was around in graduate school and the people that I ended up meeting around because I, I write about uh, the anti-war movement in the American military during the Vietnam yeah. era. You know, so many of the people that are my age that were born in maybe the late 70s or 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 80s, I, I, you know, what that age group. We we came of age when the Vietnam War was like presented to us and the 60s were presented to us by movies and TV shows in a very, very particular way. And it almost sort of uh, matches the academic sort of narrative that you're describing here, which is this sort of nostalgic, romantic yeah. vision. Um, and I mean, I'm, you know, movies like Platoon and Forrest Gump uh, that really drilled in this very specific kind of schmaltzy narrative about the 60s. And, and, and that for us was something that we wanted to Sort of. Oh, right, I think I think that right um, Oliver Stone would be wounded by the idea that platoon is schmaltzy. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, schmaltzy is not the right word for platoon, maybe. But you know what I'm getting at, right? The sort of like that. The, there's a distorted kind of vision of the '60s yeah. that's presented to us, and an, and an obsession with it. And now that makes me makes sense to me because the people who controlled, uh, you know, uh, the culture industry were people at that age who were sort of like yeah. exploring. And but you it, know what, my favorite baby boomer insanity is right now is, is, is I, I just love this so much so like what is the what is the biggest the craziest wackiest like only possible through the most like extreme magic thinking part of the QAnon cult it's that JFK Jr. is actually alive he's going to come back from the dead like Jesus that John F. Kennedy is going to come back from the dead and save the nation which is like as baby boomer as you get. It's very, very <laughs> rare to find someone who's not a baby boomer, who's not a JF, who it's very rare to find a JFK conspiracy theory, theory person who's not a baby boomer, uh, who's like working out the trauma of having kind of their symbolic daddy being, you know, kind of taken. <laughs> and the idea that somehow JFK, you know, like that, like, you know, it's like, well, a lot of these, you know, baby boomers did become like, wackadoodle reactionaries but they still managed to like work in a little bit of the minivan you know tv commercial narrative into their into their fantasy life you right. know it's crazy it's like the last gasp yeah yeah i mean I, some of those stream i mean those streams are all over your books and the kind of like idea that that there's this sort of th- those things are happening happening simultaneously but even simultaneously in, in single individuals is yeah. is disturbing um and, and and the disturbing part of your books i mean your books are they're, they're I don't know if you're aware that you write like dark comedies. You know, they're like they're for for me. Well, they, I hope they're funny. They yeah, are, and I hope they're dark. So that's dark comedy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, they they are, and they succeed at to me like kind of capturing how absurd American history can be, um, and particularly yeah. American culture and things like that. I it's just I'm in awe of how you stitch all these things together. I kind of wanted to go back to your 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 process because I know you know as a teenager okay. you're, you're collecting all your. Right. All this stuff. Are you physically collecting magazines from from the bookstore? Are, how are you? Yes, absolutely. Because this I is before before the Internet, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have a shelf over there with a lot of my fun stuff. And some of it is some stuff I've had literally for um, 
oh, let's see, I'm 51 now, so I've probably had some of that stuff for 35 years. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have all my, I stole all my brother's Dunesbury books, <laughs> you know, and that's how I knew about John Kerry. He was the really, he was the really obnoxious, snooty, arrogant a leader of Vietnam veterans against the war. Right? <laughs> I'm sure you saw the Dunesbury John Kerry series. Right? Oh yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, stuff that I remember, um, I don't, I don't know if I had this book. I think it just might've fallen apart, but I had something called the Marxist minstrels mm. and uh, it's, it's, it's a, a book, uh, by a guy named noble. I don't, I don't remember his first name, but, the argument of the book, and it's from like 1970 or something. The argument of the book is that um, the Beatles were created by Soviet propaganda in order to kind of addle the minds of American youth and kind of soften them for the takeover. And uh, David Noble's a favorite of Glenn Beck's. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I thought that was know, so common knowledge. Still that around. I don't know if he's still alive. You know? But no, I was absolutely <laughs> collecting this stuff. And But it was like that. And then I, I always give the example of, you know, like a book where like America was spelled the KKK in the middle. I picked up that one. <laughs> and, you know, but I think I, that helped me get a sense because I was dealing with the actual flotsam of the period that the 60s actually was a civil war. Yeah. You know, in a place like Milwaukee that like, you know, I could pick up both Black Panther books and John Birch Society books, you know, side by side, you know. I like that you mentioned the the flotsam of the of the era and this sort of like because so so much of what makes your your books so compelling I think is this sort of tour through all these little bits of minutia and parts of stories and pop culture that kind of come together and create a picture and I'm wondering you know where do you start with that do you start with right. the, do you start with the flotsam and then you read secondary sources and you try to match them together because it right. seems like um. You know, there's a lot of learning you have to do if you're starting young. You know, you went to grad school and everything, but it seems like um, I'm. Just, I guess I'm trying to get a grasp on how you right. how you collect no. how you collect the stuff and then stitch it together. Right, right. Well, actually, one of the I'm not going to say there's any kind of like scientific or reproducible method, but I think like uh, it is. It may possibly be interesting that the first thing I did when I was getting ready to do this book was I actually did a Dunesbury outline where I did read like the, all the Dunesbury cartoons day by day with, and, and kind of had the links and just kind of like, you know, that was kind of like provided a certain kind of spine for like our journey from 1976 to 1980. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. great. That's really, yeah. that's really I great. Love, I love, I would love for Gary Trudeau to kind of get wind of that, you know, and, uh, but you know, he actually, um, like anything else, any any piece of evidence can kind of be turned on itself and it's kind of overdetermined. And in the case of Gary Trudeau, he was um, such a kind of Watergate slash po post Watergate goo goo guy that he was obsessed with stuff that just was not that big a deal. And um, there were a lot of kind of um, corruption scandals uh, during this period that really didn't amount to much. Mm. And a lot of that had to do with um, the development of the post Watergate generation of journalists who all wanted to be Woodward and Bernstein. So they would, would basically turn Picayune things into like, you know, like Korea gate, you know, it was, there was this very corrupt guy who was working for the Korean CIA who um, opened his own basically social club and would wine and dine congressmen to try and get them to, you know, basically lobby them to, for example, keep American troops in Korea, right? And it was, it was, this guy was very scandalous, you know? I mean, this is just like Billy Carter was very scandalous right. for taking hundreds of thousands of dollars for Libya. But neither of these people um, were able to, none of this stuff was, you know, ever tied to like, you know, the Carter White House. Or any congressperson who you know kind of really was anything more than a dupe of this guy, right? Um, but there's like endless, endless cartoons about Korea Gate because 
Gary Trudeau is a product of history. Right, right. right. That's so it's just like this window onto the past, you know. That's what I was thinking about. The, speaking of, a, you know, a, a, a method, you know, methodology, you know, your secondary source here is a, is, is, is a comic book you know, or, or a comic write, writer, you know, who and, and yeah. this is like, to me, it's just a, a kind of genius entryway, but also you know, it's sort of dangerous because you're getting his... Dangerous, uh, right? No, you yeah. can't... Everything, you got to be interrogating everything. So, I mean, the best metaphor to describe what I the way I think of it is very rough, which is just like, you know, you know, like the sculptor, you know, the Renaissance sculptor who's like sees the black marble and sees the, you know, sees the Michelin, sees the David inside the marble. But this kind of history, you create the black marble, yeah. <laughs> which is this yeah. pile of crap. Yeah. yeah. But no, I mean, I think really, um, roughly speaking, I would say very roughly speaking, I would say I start with kind of secondary accounts of the yeah. period. Yeah. You know, like, um, uh, like a um, what was the what was there's a really good book by this British journalist and historian Godfrey Hodgson, uh, America in Our Time, mm. and it's a book about America from basically World War II, the end of World War II to Watergate. So that was you know I read that a long time ago, but that was you know very influential mm -hmm. in kind of giving me the sense of the basic story that the idea of consensus was central to this period of history. The idea that elites created that. America had evolved beyond ideology and the, the trauma of that being revealed not to be the case, you know, it's just the inner history of this period. You know, I mean, I could tell you like all kinds of like sex secondary sources, you know, but then I'm, I'm, there's nothing done in order. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm just like, I'm always glad to, you know, like, you know, like if I'm at the, if I'm at, you know, the, the, the modern, Rick Perlstein Renaissance Bookstore is the Printer's Row Book Fair in Chicago every summer where like this, you know, table after table of used booksellers. And if someone has a table of life magazines, you know, I'll, I'll be paging mm -hmm. through. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, I, luckily, you don't have to buy it. You can just take a picture with your phone now. <laughs> Oops. They hate um, when you do that. Yeah. Yeah. I try and <laughs> I try and throw them a blown, you know, but um, I'm but I'm, you know. And then there's and then and then the other thing, in addition to kind of secondary sources, is you know monographs, scholarship. I mean, certainly if I were writing Nixonland now, I would read your book about the coffee houses, you know, uh, and I would also chase down some of the sources yeah. because I'm yeah. a historian. No, know? that makes sense. I, I mean, I'm but, I, I also am kind of wondering at what point do you decide to frame these stories around around presidents because they're not really your your right. your books are. Um, they're they're they they're about these presidents, and I wouldn't call them quite presidential biographies. That I don't think that does a, right. a, a good service to them because there's so much more yeah. than that. At what point did you was it a conscious decision to say these are actually going to be framed around presidents, and I'm going to use the presidents as sort of an entryway into a whole co sort of psycho right. psychobiography of a nation? <laughs> I mean, I I'll, I think I at a pretty ridiculously wrong ridiculously nerdy young age, I had like the kind of psychobiography of a nation kind of conception kind of rattling around in my head. But the idea of arranging it around presidential campaigns, I think was a, a bit of an accident because when I was, you know, at Lingua Franca and writing that article about the sixties and thinking about, you know, writing my own sixties book and coming around the idea of, Oh, well, the rise of the right is the sixties story that needs to be told. Mm -hmm. At first my thought was, it was kind of like a, you know, kind of social history from the bottom up idea that I would write about, this group, Young Americans for Freedom, which really turned out not to have a lot to sustain it. And, and in a lot of ways, I realized now it was in a lot of ways always a front group, mm -hmm. you know, for kind of, uh, in this case, National Review, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but as I kind of like poked around, I realized, you know, in reading what was out there, realizing that the Goldwater campaign was, um, you know, the Sinosure. It was the confluence of all these various sorts of energies. So that kind of found me, you know, kind of organizing this around a presidential campaign. But another big influence was um, reading um, um, Parting the Waters by um, uh, Taylor Branch. Uh, so he's the guy who wrote this three-book series about – America and the King years. And I remember when I was a kid, I always had his first book, but I never picked it up. I was kind of one of these guys who had big books on my shelf and wouldn't necessarily even read them. Sure. Um, but so, and there's a, there's a third one, which I didn't read, but I read the, the middle one, mm -hmm. which goes from, you know, 62 to 65. And it, if you read that one, it's, 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 it's a very similar method to what I do, you know? 
Um, he's not quite as much into the popular culture, but the idea that it's about Martin Luther King, but it's about the cultural forces that are surrounding Martin Luther King. So that was kind of the rough kind of template I think I had in my head. Um, so by the time the Goldbauer book comes out, and I'm, you know, I had actually always roughly conceived of it as like a three book series kind of leading to Reagan. So I think that the Taylor Branch thing, mm. it's not like he's like, was kind of like, um, it's a, it's a, yeah, I would say that that, that I, roughly I was kind of trying to do what I saw him doing. And I think I also probably roughly knew that since I was not writing an academic book and that, you know, I did have to, you know, create some kind of market buzz, you know, that presidents do mm-hmm. sell. Yeah. Frank. Yeah. You know. And and I mean, it seems like you were trained in American studies, right? It seems like it's a, metho- I was, it's a yeah, methodology I was really that seems like studies. I was really inter- interested in critical theory. Actually, I really enjoyed um, anthropology classes the most. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I really liked social theory. You know, I really liked reading Pierre Bourdieu and 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 uh, stuff that's quite abstract, but just like figuring out how cultural and social change, you know, happens at the granular level. Mm. This was kind of like the theoretical question I was interested in. You know, I, and how dis is there's a lot of discourse analysis going on, right? Yeah, yeah. So like, how did you know? How did like um, a discourse evolve? And you know, Foucault was very big, and I. Not going to say I'm a Foucauldian, but the idea that you know, kind of power is a question of what ideas you know, kind of become sayable at certain um, points in time, is you know, kind of deep, deep back behind you know this really kind of um, really super, super approachable history. Right? Is you know this theoretical conception, and even like Marxism, you know, even like Frederick Jameson, mm-hmm. you know, and just like how like absurdly deep he tries to get into explaining how a thought is possible in a certain movement, a certain kind of material epoch in history that wouldn't be possible in another epoch in history. You know, it's kind of like what roughly I'm trying to kind of do. Yeah, you know? that, that that says it very well. And I think you do that very well. I mean, it, you're, you're right. Your books don't come off as academic or theoretical no. in that way. And yet at the same time, I'm having deep thoughts while I'm reading them uh, because I'm trying to co- connect, yeah. these, connect these things. I mean, one of the things that I w- w- wanted to ask you is sort of like, you know, one of the things that you you uh, is a through line, and what may, is compelling to me for a number of reasons, I think for a number of readers, is is this you know sort of darkness in in American life, and and this volume, yeah. this volume with the late seventies, you know that that year I was born yeah. is just filled with serial killers like Ted Bundy, and do you um, have the hardcover? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, I did a really, I'm really proud of the the photo insert that I did with my friend uh, Meg Handler, who's a photo uh, photo editor. And so there's like the two page spread. Yes. Of the, like all the hellish things that happened in 1978 and 1979. Unfortunately, they didn't kind of lay it out exactly as we wanted. We wanted it to be kind of in a circle. But yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, the, the, the biggest plane crash, John Wayne Gacy, you know, the Hillside Strangler, you know, it's just one thing after another, you know, Three Mile Island. Um, and, you know, by the way, so obviously I'm living during this period mm-hmm. and um, my family is not super political. You know, they're not super ideological. But one thing I definitely remember was we the, the the evening news was not like it is now. It was something that you kind of it was like eating your spinach. It was expected that you do it. It was not entertaining. Hmm. And I just remember this feeling of dread watching the news. Not anything specific, huh. but just like the, 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 the these old white men, you know, in this very dolorous, grave tone of voice talking about very scary things. <laughs> Yeah, one of my earliest memories, actually, that that conjures, speaking of darkness, is watching at a neighbor's house. I was on the floor and I was watching George H.W. Bush uh, from the from the Oval Office announcing the uh, um, the Gulf War. And I remember just being too close to the TV and the colors sort of distorting on his face and, mm-hmm. you know, being being a kid that it blurs your eyes and sort of look and just seeing monsters and, and demons <laughs> and in this face. Um, and that's just a little bit a little bit further in terms of media Statement. history. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, but looking at, I'm I'm looking at your uh, your layout right now of these pictures. Yeah, I guess it could have been in a circle or a pentagram, but it's effective anyway. A pentagram, yeah, good. Um, but I mean, I'm wondering yeah, I what's, your, what's your interest in the in that stuff? In other words, like why why do you why do you have so much so many serial killers and and sort of demonic stuff in your in your books? In in part, like why is that such a a sort of through line? Because I feel like it it, it serves several different sort of uh, rhetorical purposes in your books. Right. Well, I mean, I'd like to say that, you know, what is the, what is that German 
philosopher of history is, is like you make the, th- the thing itself. I mean, like, I'd like to think that that was a big part of experience at that time. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. I mean, maybe I overemphasize it, you know, maybe. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I think you underemphasize it. I, I'm, I, I, to me, it's it, it's stuff well, that's that, the reason. You yeah, know? I mean, it, like it doesn't really it have an answer. Um, stuff like that. It, it it brings up a sort of metaphysical questions, you know, of like right. what's going well, on in American history at that at that right. moment because well, we have and, a, and a yeah. Just, because but, just to re- complete this thought really quickly, I think about the time that I was in high school in the '90s and and. It was a different kind of darkness, but like I'm, it was Timothy McVeigh um, right. and and the Unabomber right. and the sort right. of um, uh, Colum- right. Columbine and you know a, right. a a different kind of Clintonian era violence, if that makes sense. And I don't right. know how to unpack all of that, but I'm it ju- it just seems like it's a it's a part yeah. of your books, and I think an important one. Well, yes, and it's 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 an intervention, as the grad students would say, <laughs> and. Uh, I can let me talk about Timothy McVeigh, right? Because in a way, it's a better way of talking about what I'm getting at. Because I wrote about this when I wrote a cover article for In These Times about what's going to happen when Trump is president, mm-hmm. basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was uh, a meditation on my visit to the to the to the um, Oklahoma City Memorial Museum, right? And Obviously, as historians, we know that what Timothy McVeigh was up to in this idea that, you know, kind of dark demonic string pullers are behind the scenes and have to be destroyed, you know, in order to, like, you know, redeem America in, 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 in the blood of the lamb, you know, and all these things are just this deep, strange part of this crazy, violent country we have. And that the fact that he was motivated by this um, book, The Turner Diaries, that basically in which a terrorist act is meant to instigate a race war that white people win, you know, um, that that's what the team, that's what that bombing was. Mm -hmm. That's what that, that horrifying act of bombing was. So if you go to the museum, that, that, what, what that bombing is, in the kind of symbolic nostalgia trap memory of Oklahoma City is this miraculous opportunity for a, for a city to come together and heal and prove what a wonderful place it is and what a wonderful place America is. It's like, what a gift Timothy McVeigh has given us. You know, it's like, it's like, it's like if Judas was the hero of the Bible, you know, mm-hmm. because he allows Jesus to come around, yeah, right? Yeah. But they don't mention Judas, but they do show a Bible that survived. And they do talk about all the churches. They do talk about the brave sheriff who brought him to justice, right? And there's not a single word about racism. There's not the only time terrorism is mentioned is oh, at first people thought it was terrorists, but then we realized that it wasn't, meaning <laughs> Arab. You know? Right. Of so course. Yeah. That, that's obviously so the biggest deep theme in my book. And if I wrote about the 1800s, it would be the same theme as if I happen to be writing about the second half of the 20th century. Is that America is born in blood, a crucible of blood and fire and division. And that fact, um, the, the act of kind of repressing and actively covering up and creating a political community from the act of repressing and covering up those facts is the deep structure of American political life. Mm-hmm. And that what American elites do is they tell stories about consensus in order to um, bind together the society, right? So showing what's happening in the basement, you know, underneath, you know, the chapter where all this stuff is happening is called basements, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's like, you know, Ugh. poison <laughs> oozing out of the basements at three, at, you know, there's, there's, there's three mile Island. There's, you know, John Wayne Gacy is keeping all his disgusting corpses in the basement. Right. So I'm, you know, you got to say what's going on in America's basement, you know, and how long can we keep the stench, you know? Um, and, you know, I mean, it's like, What's happening? You know, a big Reagan's a perfect metaphor for this, right? Because, you know, Reagan's like, there's no basement. What basement? You know, America doesn't have a basement. You know, America's is a city on a hill. You mm-hmm, know, mm-hmm. and then Donald Trump comes along and he said, you know, he's no. I, I the only reason I covered up the fact that uh, hundreds of thousands of people are about to die is because I'm a cheerleader, mm-hmm. and you know, I, I believe mm-hmm. in Americans' greatness, and I'm not going to say bad things about America, <laughs> which is just you know so yeah. dense and dumb, but it's very American too. Isn't it incredible, too, to watch so many, I don't know, liberals, uh, anti-Trump people sort of calling back to Reagan and saying Reagan you would never do what or never say what Trump says or never do. That's that's amazing to me. 
that's because he had, you know, Edmund Meese and James Baker and, and Michael Deaver and Peter Hannaford, you know, um, guarding him, mm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So people can see that stuff in him. You know? It's it's almost it's it, tr- Trump exposes something so rotten, I think, to, to to certain Americans that they feel like Reagan represents something something different to them, and so something nostalgic about. I mean, Trump right. presu- produced a nostalgia for Reagan among liberals, which is interesting to me. Although I guess a lot of Democrats supported Reagan. Right. Well, I mean, yeah, Democrats who later became Republicans mm-hmm. because you know they they thought it was more important to you know keep keep their suburbs white than it was to support their union. Mm-hmm, you know? mm-hmm. uh, how much, you know, do you th- the, how much do you think is a through line from Nixon to Trump in terms of, you know, your, your, your thesis in Nixon land is, is so much about resentment and so much about mm-hmm. resentment of a certain kind of elite class, even though Nixon was sort of alongside all those people at the same time. But that, yeah. that sort of resentment and that sort of, it's all like, I mean, in Nixon land, you convince me. And I think a lot of people that Nixon, uh, unleashed certain sort of energies. You talk about like what's right. possible to say, you know, and it seems right. like it's been a through line of an expansion and it's also of those. About releasing them and containing them, yeah. right? Right, so right. Even on the tapes when he says, I got to do this stuff so the real fascists don't take over, mm-hmm. you know? Um, or, you know, I mean, the fact that like there are tapes and he sounds very different on the tapes than he does in public, you know, and the whole metaphor of, you know, dog whistle politics, this idea that, um, you weaponize the most feral, dangerous energies in the mass, right? This kind of tradition of thinking about the dangers of the mass, you know, which comes out of the horrors of fascism or the horrors of the French Revolution, right? That you have politicians who have the sophistication to know that if you touch the lizard brain part of people and get into their most primal fears, yeah. That's a great route to power, but it's also very dangerous. You don't want to open Pandora's box more than just a teeny little bit, right? So this is like the best example I give of that is, you know, um, George W. Bush, you know, insisting at the same time as he starts this war against, you know, the Muslim world in a sense, Islam is a religion of peace, you know, or, or Mitt Romney kind of letting slip. No one asked me, you know, no one has to wonder where my birth certificate is, mm. you know, and apologizing for it. Mm-hmm. Right. Or, you know, Reagan's, you know, the thing I write about how, you know, different Reagan's dictated private letters are from his, you know, signed letters that he signs to like, you know, um, that is that his aides write to represent him to establishment of figures. And what Trump does is he tears down that membrane between the kind of backstage of the Republican Party and the front stage. Mm-hmm. It's, it's Quiet part, loud stuff. And the alacrity with which the rest of the Republican Party says, you know, feels that as um, a relief of a burden, you know, and and, and flocks to Trump and says, wow, we didn't even have to ever do that in the first place. Why do we bother, you know, says something about, you know, them. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, um, that's 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 the that's the that's the through line. Yeah. Basically, is is is. you know, I mean, I think that a lot of it has to do with the deeper structure of that is we're so far from the trauma of World War II. <laughs> like anti-Semitism was like a very common thing in America before the Holocaust. And then it just almost almost completely went away because people were like, wow, this is like this is playing with fire. This is like, you know. We just did a, a review in an episode uh, last week on on Stephen J. Ross's book Hitler in Los Angeles, which is about uh, oh, yeah. Nazi and fascist organizations in L.A. in the 1930s. It's fucking insane, yeah. dude. And it's like yeah. um, the the level of it. It's I mean, the, just the opening. The um, black men. We didn't even know about them. It was silver like shirts. Like a, I mean, it just goes on and on. Shirt. And there's like a, there's a, a a a map in the in the opening of the book that 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 sort of locates all the official. Um, sort of, you know, Aryan bookstores and Nazi organizations that were open, oh, wow, I should get that. operating openly, and right. the LAPD and law enforcement weren't going after them because they were they were anti communists. Yeah, and, and yeah. like, they, and and so like that that idea is, uh, yeah, it's or something the, that there I was, didn't, there was I didn't a group know. That yeah. was inspired by Coughlin. It was called the. I talk about it in my article in the New York Times Magazine, like the Christian Legion or something like that. And they were like basically like desecrating synagogues, attacking Jews, and com- with the complete cooperation of the Catholic Archdiocese in yeah. Boston. Yeah, and um, and the, 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 
it's it, it's really clear in this book um and, and in the language of like the LAPD that the the stereotype of the Jew is the, is the stereotype of the black male um and they're right. conne connected to communism uh connected But that's one of my things yeah. is like fears on the right are fungible like if you look at the the rhetoric about Jews and Catholics in the 1920s it's the same as the rhetoric of McCarthy about communists the same about sharia law you mm -hmm. know hidden string pullers and now it's the same as Antifa and sometimes the referent is um, more realistic, like, you know, they really were communists. They really were aligned with the Soviet Union. Sure. Sometimes, you know, it's it's completely insane. Like, you know, the the way these millions of Klansmen believe that the Vatican, you know, was creating kind of a secret government in the United States that, you know, was going to take over once, you know, the whistle was blown. Or, you know, the idea of Sharia law, mm -hmm. you know, totally nuts and fantastic. But the need <clears throat> to have this kind of um, structure of evil that, or, or, you know, or, or 1970s, the idea that gays were um, conspiring to recruit children and maybe even kill them, you know, um, but the need to have that um, other to civilization as the organizing kind of counterweight to your, to your, our own identity is pretty similar yeah and pretty darn american yeah and i mean and, and uh, you must be going crazy thinking about um q -Anon because it really is a <laughs> you know a, a phenomenon that sort of combines a lot of the different streams that you write about in your book in terms of the american sort of mindset and its ability you know the 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 population's ability to sort of coalesce around certain insane ideas i mean we have flat earthers now right like there's like a significant number of people who believe that and it's just mm, like they probably always were though that's the thing yeah you know? yeah that's true that's the weird thing it's like when I was when I was like I remember like maybe like ten years ago and around the Tea Party time and I was just like talking to a friend of mine who's a British journalist and I was like man I'm just like so jealous like you know there's not this crazy like like everyone in in, in Britain you know like you, you know like seventy percent of the population doesn't like want everyone to be like criminals to be fried in electric chairs he's like oh no 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 it's the same it's just that Brit people in Great Britain don't it's not a democratic culture. So people don't think that they're, they're licensed or authorized to speak about their ideas. Mm. Right. Which is kind of like all my, all my friends who are like foreign correspondents from, from other countries in America, <laughs> like they love America and they love kind of democracy, but that's kind of the other side of the coin. It's like when I went to like a, a meeting of um, Swedish parliamentarians in Chicago and they were all wearing the same black suit, you know, it's like, these are guys who are not going to invent bluegrass, you know, it's like these guys are going <laughs> to, you know, so you're barbecue. saying so you're saying we just yeah. talk a lot about what we think and our stupid ideas in America. Well, I mean, it's, 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 well but now they have Brexit, so basically that you know kind of that Pandora's box has <laughs> kind yeah. of been. You know, the idea that that there weren't flat earthers. I mean, it's it's a question of medium. I mean, now the, the flat earthers have just as much rep, right to have a YouTube page or you know to tweet <laughs> as you know guys who you know, went to Axbridge or, or, or the LSE or, or, uh, Science Po in Paris, you know? Um, yeah, so, no, it makes me wonder. Know, I, mean, I mean, there's also like, you know, disinformation and fake news and Facebook and the sort of ability to, to, to twist the, the narrative, it, the media narrative, it seems well, like that's you know, where you get the cap, the, the, the capitalism, you know, it's like the old yeah. Lent in line about capitalists being, you know, willing to, you know, sell you the rope that they're going to hang themselves with, you know? I right mean, or at just, least you know, yeah uh, create, i mean part of the part of the thing that people say about facebook and, and social media is that it's broken consensus which is another kind of repeat of the mythology you're talking about is that we were all sort of right. we were all sort of on the no, same page consensus. yeah yeah it, it's just revealed you know the, the 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 conflicts that were you know already there you know but you know exacerbated in certain kinds of ways because um algorithms you know <laughs> algorithms that that basically spread anger better than they spread consensus you know mm. but we've had those algorithms before that was direct mail was a kind of algorithm like that you know as a weaponization of fear 
Yeah, no, you do uh, the the evangelical stuff um, <laughs> in your book. I mean, we just had uh, uh, Kristen Kobes Dume on the show, who wrote a book called Jesus and John Wayne. Um, that's out. Oh, that sounds great. Very I recently. Look at that up. Yeah, you would love it, dude. Listen to the interview if you want. Go buy the book. Uh, it, she talks about sort of the weaponization of uh, evangelical Christianity and, and its move towards. Um, you know, an embracing of a sort of uh, violent masculine image. Uh, and she talks about John Wayne, but she also talks about, you know, um, one of the biggest heroes of, of, of Republicans in the 90s is uh, William Wallace, the char character Mel Gibson plays in Braveheart. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I remember that. It's just she has a lot of great ideas about exactly the kind of thing you're, you're, you're kind of hitting on. Um, but I, I have a question just because there are, we're, we're running yeah, out of time. Last one. But there's, yeah, yeah. there's a mi million things that I can ask you. But I wanted to ask you this about, about sort of this, this moment because one of the things that that um is happening right now is bob woodward is in the news um speaking of <laughs> speaking of nixon and i mean I, it's a perfect example of exactly what we're talking about and this, this may, maybe is a good place to end because it's the nostalgia trap of i feel like there's a lot of all the president's men fans right now who are like this is gonna you know be the same as watergate and this is gonna bring down and it seems like Trump kind of I don't know he seems like he survives these things and 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 the moment has changed and the, and the capacity for shock about a president lying to us isn't quite the same but I'm wondering what your right. thoughts are on that. Well, I mean, you know, one question I've gotten a lot is, you know, um if Fox News had been around in the 70s would Nixon have survived? Mm -hmm. And you know, I think roughly speaking probably because one of the things is that was really striking in Invisible Bridge was, you know, kind of reading the letters to the editor, you know, the rhetoric is the same as what you see in, you know, right wing media, which has just like much, 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 much greater reach. And, you know, you did have these kind of elite media gatekeepers, you know, who were quote unquote nostalgic, mm -hmm. you know, for the three white men who, you know, told us what to think every night. But, you know, to, in a, to, to a certain degree, you know, um, that sort of disciplinary function for kind of, um, you know, bad demagogic ideas. Um, you know, those guys got us in the Vietnam war. True. You know, so let's think dialectically about it. Mm -hmm. But, um, um, you know, uh, once Bob Woodward and it took a while and there were a lot of contingencies and a lot of things that had to happen in order for the elite to basically not consider Woodward and Bernstein, these um, annoying gadflies who didn't deserve to be talked about in the polite circles of Georgetown. But once they decided that what they were up to was um, in fact legitimate, um, that was amplified in a way that made it possible to, you know, save our democracy before it was too late. Mm -hmm. um, now those energies are coming from different places. Yeah. Yeah. Rick Perlstein, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And and again, thank you for writing books that have uh, 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 caused me to run to uh, my, my bookshelf and grab it and read it out loud to my wife uh, when we're having arguments <laughs> about politics because I want to share some specific moment. Um, so thanks for writing incredible books and thanks for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thanks, David. Bye-bye. That was fun. Take care. All right, everyone. Well, that's going to do it for today. I want to give a huge thank you to Rick Perlstein. It was wonderful to finally get to talk to him. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. And also a thank you to Danny Bessner for talking to us about our film series. Go and check that out at patreon.com slash nostalgia trap. We are very excited to bring you uh, some deep talk uh, on, on cinema and pop culture. So go check that out if you'd like. And thank you to all the people who are supporting the show. And we'll talk to you again very soon. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.